I am Bill Huffman, and welcome to this week's bonus episode of Who Killed Amy Mihaljevic, where Nick from the True Crime Garage podcast and I conclude our discussion about the investigation discovery documentary, The Lake Erie Murders, Who Killed Amy Mihaljevic. And I also want to say thank you again to the listeners for their support, and to let you know that there will be more episodes to come on this case, as well as new interviews and theories. In the meantime, let's jump right back into the conversation I was having with Nick from the True Crime Garage podcast. Yeah, we never did chat about your other uh, theory. We'll go ahead with what you were just uh, talking. I didn't mean to interrupt you. No, you're fine. And um, But one thing that when we covered the Oakland County child killer case, which I think it should be called the Oakland County child killers because I believe multiple people were involved in that. But one thing that we didn't discuss during that that portion is these children were kept for an extended period of time before they were killed and then dumped. And there's a lot of people that have speculated throughout the years that that case is somewhat connected to Amy's case. And, you know, that's where we were kind of beating around the bush a little bit in getting to there. But my theory with the Oakland County child killer case is – when, when these kids were kept and you referenced the chicken, you know, they, they determined that the, the last meal that Timothy King ate was chicken. And he, the, his mother stated in a, it was either a radio or TV interview shortly before he was found that he, she just wants him to come home so she can cook for him his favorite meal, fried chicken. And so a lot of people throughout the years have always thought, well, this was the killer's way of taunting the parents, taunting the media, taunting police, saying, hey, I'm, I know you're looking for me. I'm watching you so much so that I fed this kid exactly what his mother stated in that interview. I actually think what was going on with these kids is I think, you know, because it's often reported that they were bathed, that they were well taken care of during the time that they were held captive. I think that they were being told to do certain things or go along with certain things. And I think they were rewarded. And, and I think that was their way of the the chicken bone would have been a reward for, for something terrible. But um, I think that, and then when they, when whomever was holding them got tired of rewarding them or couldn't reward them anymore, it was time to get rid of this this problem that I've I've kept in my house for X number of days. Now, which leads me to a long way of saying this. I had a dream the other night about Amy's case. And I was kind of like visually, I, I don't know that I was really seeing it, it, it go down or see it, a portion of it go down. But I think the opposite happened with Amy's case. I think at some point she fought back and didn't go along with whatever this person wanted. And I think ultimately that's why she was killed. Not to say that it was her fault because we all should fight back. Anybody makes you do something you don't want to do, you fight back. But I, I think that it looks to me like this, I think that this individual thought that there could have been some type of relationship. I think that he was sexually attracted to her. I think that he would have preferred to keep her alive and well, as long as he thought he could like in the Oakland County child killers case, but couldn't because she fought back. And I think she fought back fairly quickly. And I also wonder one thing that I've wondered about this case is we talked about, you know, there was blunt force trauma to the, was it the back right side of her head? And then, yeah, the back right, and then back right side. Then stab wounds on the left the side neck. of the neck. Yeah. Yeah. And so he, he must have hit a carotid, the carotid artery because mm-hmm. she pretty much bled out is the way that uh, I've always been told that the autopsy reads. Right. And, so I almost wonder if the first portion of her fighting back was inside this person's vehicle. You know, if she's sitting shotgun and he has to 
striker that's or whatever. exactly the theory that james so james back when james and i met in 2000 and gosh when was it 2007 2008 and uh we had met at the plaza and we we're just discussing the case and we used to get beers together and you know discuss amy's case and that was when i was working at uh one of the local news stations and we went down to the down to the uh site where she was found but the theory that we kept coming up with or at least that i kept coming up with because the stab wounds weren't very large right so you know the thought was okay he's driving in the car she's putting up a fight and now what the hell do you do and the thought was okay he takes her and smashes her head against the side of the car window and or he has something in the back seat like ted bundy style you know he would you know, the thing that Bundy would use, I mean, sometimes would even be able to kill the person. Yeah. Or, I mean, at the very least, knock them unconscious. But the stab wounds to the neck are obviously what were the were the killer. So um, the, the drive, like we've discussed, is, again, she was found 50 miles from where, where she was taken. If, you know, what the hell happened between here and there? Yeah. And... That's where this whole fucking case comes together. Yep. Put those two together or, you know, connect those three things and you'll have your answer. But I mean, I do, the thing about James's theory that the circumstantial evidence is always going to be there, you know, with James's person. Mm -hmm. And you can't deny the fact that the guy lived close to the, where the body was found. And... Right. I mean, yeah. but then you also wonder, what the hell are they waiting for? Other than, unless the science, unless they like feel like they've got enough on somebody else. I mean, I, I just don't, I don't know. They've been, I mean, even Spetzel said before, like we've been able to convict people in Bay on circumstantial evidence, strictly circumstantial evidence. And even referenced a case in like 2001 of some carpenter who was killed in, in Bay and they were able to convict. So it just, I think, exact I, question. I think it's because, and I don't know that there's good reason for this, but I think it's because they really think that it's not him. I, I, there's no other answer. I mean, and I don't know what it is that makes them think that it's not him. I don't think that, look, if, if there were something that cleared him, they would say that they would, they would tell us because what I've have heard multiple times in interviews that what some that you have done, done some that TV, you know, networks have done. They are always very quick to remind us that just because somebody wrote a book and that person has a suspect, we, we've not made an arrest yet. We don't know who this individual is. You know, they're, they're very quick to point that out and very forthcoming with that. They want the public to know that, you know, they don't know who the guy is. That was and, the number one thing Torres and he wanted me to say. And he's like, yeah. the reason why I'm doing this is because just because something's been published doesn't mean it's true. And right. we still want tips. We still, right. and the fact that they are still, I mean, James has been doing this on his blog for, you know, over a decade now. And you know, the tips that he gets, you know, sometimes he gets them before, sometimes he gets them after, but the FBI and the police are still following up on him. So if the fact that if it, they thought it was this one guy, they wouldn't be following up on these other tips, would they? Right. And, and, and I don't want to, you know, piss on anyone's Cheerios, but the thing here is that the thing that scares me about Amy's case and really saddens me about Amy's case, you people, you, when we, when they catch the golden state killer, you know, when they catch Christy Merrick's killer, right. April Tinsley's killer, everybody gets excited because they think that, Oh, the case that that's been haunting me for all these years is could be the next one that they solve through familial DNA. Mm -hmm. But 
again, I don't want to ruin anybody's day, but, but the one thing that I pointed out to some people that, that came to me and spoke to me about Amy's case and said those exact words, do you think that with all this new technology that with familial DNA that they will be able to crack Amy's case? And I said, I wouldn't get too optimistic about Amy's case. And the reason being is all the, you know, and I know that there's some out there that have been solved that I'm unaware of. So I don't know every story. I don't know every case that has been solved using this new technology or this new method, I should say. But the ones that I am well aware of, and not to get too gross, they had a lot of DNA to work with, a lot. And I don't feel like Amy's case that they have a lot to work with. Now, that doesn't mean that technology won't advance and that they someday will have enough. But all those other cases, they had a lot to work with. Yeah, Tinsley's case, for example, I mean, the guy literally left his DNA as like many four places as he could possibly yeah. could. Four or five different places. And with Christy Merrick's, they had DNA on her body and on the carpet around her. You know, Wasn't uh, that the, chewing gum, too, that caught him? Well, he had I, discarded, he, they, so they went oh, to his, oh, work gotcha. They, 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 gum. gotcha, gotcha. They, they were able to connect him that way. And then, yeah, that was just uh, resolved this week. Yeah. And then, so you have the Aurora hammer, hammer slayer that there, there was multiple, they caught him, but there was multiple crime scenes. There was multiple victims that he left DNA. And then there, the, I mean, the golden state killer had, 10 victims, a dozen victims. And, and, and then on top of that, many rapes that, that he right. didn't kill. So unfortunately I'm just kind of doing the, the math here myself. And I don't, I don't feel like this is a good candidate for the, for the breaks that we've been seeing within the last 18 months. I don't think it fits into that yet. I'm hoping I'm wrong. I would love to be, look, as I always say, I'd rather be surprised than right in this situation. Um, so I hope that I'm, I'm wrong. I, I think that in the immediate future, our best hope is that, that something comes from the public. And I think that Torsney and, and Spetzel and those guys are very good and very smart to remind the public that, Hey, we still need your help. We're sitting here waiting for this, this other stuff to go on that we can't control. Right. You know, they, they, their only hope to getting a confession, we just said DNA or, or confession is, is really the only way that I see this thing getting resolved. The only way they're getting a confession at this point is talking to somehow talking to the right person. Because yeah, uh, I mean, unless you get a deathbed type confession, but I mean, if this guy hasn't cr cracked um, in, you know, all these years, I, I don't think he's just cracking for no reason. Yeah. And I think, you know, the one thing that I emphasized in, in my podcast was, you know, when a case goes on this long, I mean, obviously your theories can run all over the place. And I mean, the theory that we discussed earlier about, you know, Ted Lamborghini and the fact that, you know, his connections to the Oakland County killings and, you know, or the, at least the, the ring that was occurring in Michigan, it does make you wonder, you know, and I know, yeah, Ford isn't GM and I get, I get the connect, you know, I get that, right. but it doesn't mean that he couldn't have been friends with the mechanics at the GM dealership that Mark frequented and um, could have been there on days that he was, you know, visiting or doing his sales thing. Obviously, it wasn't his DNA because they would have already because he's in jail serving life at the moment for yeah. other crimes. But you know, it does beg the question, especially with James just brought up about three different hairs. But I mean, wasn't Lamborghini the thing? <laughs> yeah, wasn't Lamborghini questioned about it, and he refused to answer questions regarding Amy Mahal? Because so for for those of the yeah. people that will be listening to this. Mm -hmm. After the Oakland County case, mm -hmm. uh, after the killing stopped up there, at some point, Lamborghini moved from that area to Northeast Ohio. So that's why he's... Par we're Parma Heights. Exactly. Yeah, Parma Heights. 
which is about 20 minutes from Bay Village. So, um, I mean, it's not super close, but it's definitely, it's with, let's put it this way. When they say that they're not able to trace the phone calls um, because they weren't long distance. Right. Well, Parma Heights isn't long distance. So, same, I mean, it just, again, code. it just, same area code. So it, it brings up all these different damn theories and people run wild with all different speculations, but you know, it's like, uh, you know, Occam's razor. It, it's gotta be the simplest answer. I mean, it, it 99.9% of the time, it's not a giant conspiracy. It's not some pedophile ring or, um, some mastermind criminal. I mean, th this is probably somebody's dad, which is just disgusting yeah. to think. And that's very just likely been living a one-off. Yeah, a one-off, and had been living with a secret for thirty years. And to, like you said, if he hasn't cracked yet, unless they get him in the corner with some evidence that he can't deny, I don't see him like just one day waking up and feeling like I got to get this off my chest type of thing. I mean, as much as we would all love that to be the case, um, I think he's probably pretty confident at this point that, you know, he's gotten away with it so far. Yeah. And I think the pressure, you know, the, like the podcast and the documentary, the documentary was great because it did bring it to like the national level. I mean, I know that it's always been a national, I mean, your podcast is national by podcast national um you know they reach people that watch id or whatever aren't necessarily our listeners too so right. this did open up a whole new avenue of people that now know about the case and it's kind of like what torsney said we still want people from you know cops even from other jurisdictions to think about hey are there any damn similarities between Amy's case? Because, I mean, think about the, the circumstances that surround Amy's case and how she was kidnapped are the most unique of any kidnapping situation that I can think of. Other, I can't think of one that's more mysterious. I mean, who the fuck calls and sets up and arranges a kidnapping with the chance that he could just be picked up right then and there? I mean, well, right then and there, the cops could just be waiting. Hey, you know, what were you doing? You know, I know this was before to catch a predator and all that, you know, dateline stuff. But in all reality, the guy was putting himself out there. Like, I know he couldn't have gotten charged with anything, I guess. I mean, would he not? I mean, he probably wouldn't have been charged with anything. But I don't know, maybe soliciting a minor. I don't know. It, it well, just that whole ruse is i think the reason why so many people are fascinated by this case so first of all you have it's 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 almost that phone call invited a killer into their home you know picking up that phone on that day it's almost like in, it's almost like letting the killer in your front door in a way you know mm -hmm. what is it lost boys where the the vampire <laughs> yeah gets get some kind of formal greeting by the man of the house into their home. So there, therefore he can, I can't remember how that went down, but that's what I kind of picture. You pick up, pick up the phone and it's inviting the killer into your home almost. And I think that for parents at the time in Ohio, that's what terrified them. And that's why they read about the case. That's why they watched the news, hoping that, that somebody would be arrested and arrested soon because it was haunting and terrifying to think that, Hey, this killer used the phone to enter our home and take our little girl. And she never came back. And then years later, the fascination behind that ruse is for people like you and I, the, the armchair detectives, there is meat mm -hmm. on the bone for us. You know, if, mm -hmm. if somebody, if somebody is snatched off the street and there's no eyewitnesses, there's no screams, there's no nothing. Nobody saw a car. Nobody saw a guy. There's no meat on the bone. There's nothing for us to investigate. And right. because there was this phone call, and thank God she told somebody. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's one thing that I, I just thank God that she told somebody because he didn't want her to tell anybody. 
And had she not, we would have maybe have never made this connection, never known that, that she was in communication with this guy. Well, that's the reason why I, I don't believe that he had anything to do with Margaret. I think that he knew that she would eventually tell somebody. And so he's not going to put himself out there and be like, oh, you know, I actually have connections with Margaret. He's going to you, you do the opposite. Uh, I mean, he's going to play misdirection right off the bat. I mean, if, the, if this is his, let's say, eighth, ninth, tenth attempt at doing this, he's probably fine-tuned his, you know, his pitch and figured, well, I, you know, kids are kids. They're going to probably tell somebody. So I'm going to just come up with something other than, I mean, I'm going to use her mom's work as the conduit, but the fact I'm not actually from her, her background or anything like that. Here's the thing too about, you know, I said earlier, he, he either got lucky and said the right thing, or he had good knowledge and knew what to say. But we, we kind of got into this last time, well, maybe two times ago when we spoke, but I was telling you, I was like, you don't have to be a genius to manipulate this child, even though she's very smart. It, you could play the numbers and, manip and and be right. And what I mean by that is, if you call a home, home phone number mm -hmm. in, in 1989 at 3.15 in the afternoon, you're playing the, per it's a higher percentage that a child is going to be home without an adult at that time than if you called after five. So you're playing the, you're playing the percentages. It's just like poker. You play the percentages. Now, here's another thing. I'm talking to you for the first time, and I want to prove to you that I know you in a loose, roundabout way. You don't know me, but I know your mother. Well, why would I pick mother instead of father? Guess what? More people have, if, if it is a single parent home, more people have a mom at home than they do a dad. You're playing the percentages. Mm -hmm. This is something this dude has worked through. Some of the stuff he knew and some of the stuff he, 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 he knew enough to get right. Yeah. I mean, the whole, the, did I ever tell you about my, like I had a, a phone call that caught me off guard. Did I ever tell you my situation? You t briefly, but I want to like, hear I'll it. run you through it real quick again. Um, you know, just to like, yeah, we all look at, oh my gosh, you know, this girl's talking to a stranger on the phone and she dropped her guard and she's going to go meet this guy. I was 16 and I was in the plane dealer for being, you know, like one of the top area all-star runners or something like that. And uh, there was a color picture of me in the paper and like a week went by and um, I get a phone call and this guy claims that he's a reporter from the Westlife and like right away my guards like dropped and he's like, would you want to do a phone interview? And I was like, hey, sure. Why not? Because, you know, I just done the plane dealer. Why not? You know, it's just a local guy. And, you know, he asked me like normal questions and stuff, but he literally kept me on the phone for probably 15 minutes, 20 minutes. Uh, I didn't know who the hell I was talking to, but I was just talking away. And, you know, the abnormal thing that he asked me was what size shoe do I wear? And, you know, he ended up calling back a week later and said some preferred things. And so like, I kind of have a personal connection to the fact that a kid can get called at home. I mean, I remember being scared to death the fact that the guy knew my phone number. He knew my address. So whoa, whoa, whoa. Was, hang on. How do you think he got your phone number? Now I have a theory on who this individual is and okay. So, so you don't know 100% who it was. I, I don't know 100% who it was, but my family had connections to certain, there were certain activities that I, I was involved in that I could have been cross paths with this certain individual that I know has gotten in trouble for similar type of things. And right. uh, James and I had discussed this individual, I think on an episode three, possibly, or episode five, I'm not sure. Um, but uh yeah. So like for me, like it's a, I have, obviously I have the personal connection that I was Amy's age. I grew up, you know, just a few miles from where she did. We probably ran in the same circle, but the fact that she was convinced to go meet this guy, I feel, I feel empathetic to her. Like I just, 
yeah, it sounds so dumb. Like, yo, why would you go do that? But she was just trying to do something nice for her mom. And that's what makes it so tragic at the end of the day. I mean, really. And she was a little kid. I mean, even if you think, even if, even if somebody were to tell me, Hey, she did a really stupid thing meeting this guy. I, I've heard that from a few people and I want to grab those people and shake them and go, she was a child. She was manipulated by somebody that had much more real life experiences Mm -hmm. than she did. And, and not only did he manipulate her, but he denied her of all those real life experiences after shortly after that took place. She was a child. Um, it's, it's, it's unfortunate. She was not a dumb kid. She was manipulated. Uh, it, yes, it was a dumb thing to do, but, and that's why I think that at some point she realized, oh shit, I screwed up. This person mm-hmm. isn't who they told me they were. We're not going to where he said we're going. And I, and I think she was a, not only smart, but I think she was probably a tough kid. And I think she fought back at some point and said, you know what? I'm not going to do what you tell me to do. And I don't care how this turns out, but you're, but you're not going to, you know, just be able to do whatever you want to do. I think after, sometime after the phone call, sometime after the phone call to her mom, I think she figured it out. And I, and I struggle with that too, because it's when I like to, that's what keeps me up at night. When, when you know enough about the case to, to play it through in your mind and, and let your mind one wild and try to figure out what and why, how did things happen? You know, I struggle with, did, did he have a gun on her when she made that phone call? Did he threaten mm-hmm. her and then she make that phone call or did, or did she, was she still unaware and playing along at that point when, when the phone call was made? Yeah. And that, you know, when you bring that up, it, you know, they always talk about how Margaret had this sixth sense that something else was going on. But if you read the newspaper reports and you read the, like the actual police reports from that day, she wasn't actually able to get out of work right away. I mean, it's not like she, she got that phone call and ran right home. She may have thought something was off, but it wasn't as dramatic as no surprise there. It wasn't as dramatic as some people have made it out to be because it was, I think it was, you know, it was a Friday. So I think she didn't even get home until five. So, you know, he had a good head start with whatever he was planning to do but the fact that she was like unlike the oakland county kids where they were apparently kept alive for a period of time amy's the remains in her stomach and what they were able to determine was that she was not even alive for more than 24 hours at the most 48 hours after the abduction and that goes to what you were saying before about her putting up a fight not going and not going the way the guy wanted it to as well as the fact that when he first set out on this plan, whatever you want to call it, that his hope was to have more time with the with Amy than what he actually ended up with because of the fact that she was a fighter. And her dad even said she was an athlete. She wouldn't yeah. have gone with somebody she didn't know. So my guess is she put up a struggle. She was manipulated. But like you said, I think she quickly realized I'm in and over my head and – I'm now in somebody's car that I don't know who and what is going to happen to me. Yeah. And that's, a, that's the scariest thing for anybody. I think, especially for parents that have, are just learning about this case, like anybody that didn't know of this, you know, the phone calls. And now we have just so many different means to get access to kids with, and that's what Torsney was saying. He's like with the internet and just with Twitter and God, you, you name the, you name the meet social media outlet. I think Spetzel even brought it up. Like the amount of information that kids just put out there, just out in the universe. You know, I don't have children myself, so um, I luckily don't have to. I don't have that worry, but I can't imagine not being concerned about that. Uh, you know, it just it's so it's so disconcerting to think that one this guy is still out there and if he just decided like you know btk what btk took time off it's not to say that this guy couldn't kill again i mean it's not like hey i'm you know i'm a killer and i'm uh you know i'm not gonna do it again you know once a killer always a killer 
Well, and, and a bazillion things could have happened to interfere with that if he if he did intend to kill again. Um, I, it was actually Dennis Rader, BTK, that said because he he kind of he combats the whole thought because he is the first person that the the that the experts go to when like the okay for instance the Colonial Parkway murders there was. If they're if in fact all those murders are connected, it was four separate killings. You know, the, there were eight killings total, but mm-hmm. it happened at four different times through the span of like I don't know a year and a half or something like that. Two years, let's say. Well, they they are very quick to point out when when they stopped. All these people say, well, you know. Uh, something must have happened because the, the, the killing stopped. And then the FBI is very quick to point out and go, well, Dennis Rader, we now know that because of BTK that, that they can stop. And sometimes they do stop. And sometimes there's very long periods in between killing. What I found fascinating was Dennis Rader said, no, I, they can believe whatever they want. I never stopped killing. And he's not saying, Hey, I, there's victims out there. A lot of people think there's victims out there that we're unaware of. And that's what he means by that. But mm. what, what he means by that is, and you can, you can, this can be found, you know? So he says, I was always looking for the next victim. I was always trolling. I was always hunting. I was always working one of these projects. Life got in the way. I, I had a job. I had a family. I had, uh, you know, I was involved in the Boy Scouts. My, I, my kids had obligations. I, had, I w- had obligations at church. Sometimes life got in the way of his hobby. You know, he, <laughs> something he considered to be his, his uh, secret career. Um, so and, disturbing. you know, he doesn't put it so succinctly, but that's, that's the truth. That's what he means there is that I, never stopped just life got in the way um so who knows what this guy this could i i I think you and i feel very similar that it's likely a one-off um i wouldn't be surprised if the individual moved away Mm -hmm. i i I think what would surprise me the most is if 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 in fact when they do make a, a an arrest if they find the guy in northeast ohio i think that will be a bit shocking to me um that would be really i think that would open up so many different questions if he was actually found i mean if he was found still living in the area then i mean every case that has been unsolved in the last 30 40 years is going to be re-examined because well how did he slip through the cracks right before we wrap up Mm -hmm. i want to say one i loved the podcast and Thank you. I'm hoping that there's more episodes. The uh, it was the highlight of my Friday morning for a very long time, and uh, you've taken that from me, Bill. Now that you've gone away, so I need a little <laughs> more. Uh, okay. I need you to bring back my Friday mornings. But after, what's the next project for you? Is well, it, do you have the something next, in the works uh, or an idea? Do you want to share well, that with everybody? Well, I'm I'm actually going to be working on a book. Um, okay. I've I've been putting together a book for for a number of I don't want to say years, but uh, for a while now. And uh, with what's transpired with the podcast and um, with everything that you know, the success of the podcast, I don't know. I've got a story to tell that you know I'm hoping to get published at. Um, at some point in the next uh, the next year, and James and I have, were talking about it before we jumped on the you know the chat today, and uh, hopefully you know hopefully that will be my next step. But in the process or in the uh, in the meantime, the Who Killed will become a series, and I'm probably going to do it's not so much similar to what you guys do, where you do one case a week. I'll probably do like mini series opposed to having like 16 episodes dedicated to the, the Mahalovic case. I'll probably do four episodes dedicated to a particular case. And so it will be like mini kind of like mini, it will just kind of be a rolling show similar to what your show is. And I'm not going to have necessarily seasons, but just mostly episodes, um, okay. you know, 
episode 17, episode 18. Like this, this will be under the Who Killed Amy Maholovic podcast, obviously, and you know, the round table. But, um, but yeah, the goal has been and always has been to turn the Who Killed into a series. And because there's always that person that every town has a case that they want solved. And I, um, I'm committed to to the medium. I love the I love the podcast medium. The feedback's been fabulous. Don't read the negatives. <laughs> it's what I've learned. Uh, you know, as far as reviews go. Um I mean sometimes they can be helpful, but sometimes they can be uh you know. I think that you guys I was listening to your guys' Q and A on off the record. You were talking about taking uh you know, how do you take the compliments? <laughs> right. And and then the captain had a good response said, well, if you, if you take the compliments too seriously, then you're going to take the negative comments too seriously. And so like, that's something that I've learned through the podcast is, you know, everybody's got an opinion <laughs> yeah. and not everybody's doing something about it, but they can type in their little, you know, phone and tell you, you suck. And, uh, <laughs> You know, well, and some of them can be rather it. vicious, um, you know, but it's, 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 I think that people sometimes forget that, they, you know, we're just human beings. We're just regular dudes with feelings and, you know, mm-hmm. and, you know, so, but uh, yeah, it's, I think your show has been fantastic. Um, so I look forward to the, you know, what's, what's left of it. And I look forward to when you take your next case. Yeah, I mean, the, obviously, when anything breaks with Amy's case, you know, the the show is never, it's just like the case. It's not closed, you know. It's right. not an old, it's not a cold case. It, I mean, the case is going to maintain, it's going to kind of just be an existing show that will I will continually update. But the I'm going to also do other shows along the lines of, you know, who killed. And I do want to do, and I and I've not really brought this up to too many people but one of the podcasts that i want to do because i have a uh, i started a media company and so i want to have kind of like a stable of podcasts and one of the podcasts that i i'm a big fan of uh if you listen to crime town it's a gimlet show yeah. Yeah. um they did uh the first it's really worth listening definitely worth listening to it's really good okay. um they it's all about uh the corruption in providence rhode island and how basically the city was run by this corrupt mayor um it's got true crime mixed in i mean it's all you know the guy went to jail and all that good stuff right. but the city of cleveland itself is so i mean we just saw it with serial obviously with I mean, i'm not sure if you listened to it or not but you know they did the whole justice system as far as like they were in the justice center for a year and basically it broke down man this system's fucked up <laughs> but yeah. cleveland itself like i want to do you know to branch out beyond just true crime i mean i guess this is still true crime but um in the 70s you know the mafia and the irish and cleveland they really didn't get along very well and i think it, i forget which year it was but i mean there were 36 bombings just in the city of cleveland that were mafia related so i have a desire to do a podcast on that whole era of when like chandra burns and um john nardi and danny green were uh kind of the the people that ran the well, the ports and basically all the underground criminal activity in the city. Yeah. So that's kind of something that I'm uh, going to also do in 2019. So look for that. I'm not sure. I haven't come up with a title for that podcast yet, but um, I mean, since crime town's already been taken, <laughs> 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 well, but that, yeah, that, that uh, that's one that I, yeah, it's, I mean, I don't know if you ever, did you see to kill the Irishman, the movie? No. Uh, I mean, it's it's got Christopher Walken, uh, Vincent D'Onofrio, and, mm-hmm. but it's all about the the case that I'm talking about, the Danny Green um, 
Danny Green was this Irishman who basically took on the Italian mafia in huh. Cleveland and was like, now I'm in, now I'm in charge. Right. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> uh, it's on Netflix right now. So if you got two hours to kill, it's, it's, it will teach you some stuff that you didn't know about Cleveland. I might so watch that's it this weekend. Yeah, it's it's worth it. I mean, it again, it's it's really ironic because they shot the movie in Detroit, which pissed me off because when like when they were filming it, I remember writing I was writing screenplays at the time and I was like, "Man, why the hell can't they just film it here?" And then just this past year they filmed filmed White Boy Rick in Cleveland, which is all based in Detroit. <laughs> So it's like, <laughs> it's like everything's ass backwards when it comes to filming movies. <laughs> right. And so, um, and I had actually written like, you know, I wrote some screenplays when I was in my twenties and the first, the second screenplay I wrote was a fictional story about Amy's abduction. And basically it involved like a whole pedophile ring. So like whenever James brings that up, I always kind of laugh because it's like, yeah, I kind of, I've danced around that, but it was in a fictional, fictional sense. So, right. And how has everything been going with you guys? And off the record, I've been, uh, I've been catching up with all the. Uh, I mean, I've shit. I just listened to your West Memphis, West Memphis Three off the record, and then your follow up to it. And again, like you said, you could do that case every freaking week. <laughs> <laughs> because. You know it. Man, that does not have any answers either. No, and and especially when the captain and I get to talking about it, we're both long-winded people, and uh, it's uh, he and I can. I mean, do we just go round and round and round on that case? And there's some cases that are hard to put together a great presentation because of that. You know that mm-hmm. it's you you get lost in the you get lost in the words yourself a little bit. And you, you go round and round on something and you, you look at your computer and you go, oh, wow, we just talked about that one thing for 20 minutes. And we got, you know, a whole story to tell here. But no, things have been, things have been going great. The show's been going really well. Uh, our numbers have spiked recently. And I don't, I, the only thing I, you know, I, I would like to think it was because, we, you know, the documentary, the the Lake Erie murders. I can, but I, it, I can attest it was because my okay. numbers have significant. I mean, we're talking. I mean, I, your numbers are way higher than my numbers, but as far as what I'm seeing, you know, I'm doing them like from when the day that it came out, I started doing ten thousand downloads a day. Yeah. So well, your yours it, will come up very quickly with the Amy Mahalovic Google search, which is yeah, it's which crazy. Is yeah. Yeah, it's it's wild. I remember like they somebody sent me an article. I was quoted in an E News article, and I was like, <laughs> "What the hell? <laughs> <laughs> this is weird." <laughs> but yeah, so, yeah, I think the attention was definitely. I think it was extremely worthwhile, and I'm glad. Like you and I talked about the concern of it coming out cheesy and. I remember yeah. you placing a bet on whether or not it would or wouldn't. I'm not going to say which one you went with, but um, <laughs> I, I would have to say that you were probably happy with the way it turned out. I, again, in most situations, I would prefer to be surprised than to be right. And I was very pleasantly surprised. And, you know, I actually received a little bit of a backlash from some friends and family. And I, I sometimes with these, so our show off the record a lot of times we'll record multiples of those in one, you know, one session. So I, I tend to forget what I've spoke about on mic and what I haven't, but uh, <laughs> several of my friends and family saw it afterwards and then came to me and they're like, why didn't you tell me you're going to be on this thing? I said, well, first of all, if you know anything about TV or movies and you know, <laughs> if it, when you're, when you're on my level, it you even though you were filmed you don't know if you're in something until you sit down and watch it yourself you know uh so i said i didn't want to tell a bunch of people hey i'm going to be on this thing and then you sit down and watch for three hours and my my ugly mug never shows up on your screen so can i can uh, i say that i did the opposite and i was like 
oh yeah they came and interviewed me and it was great and uh then like about a week into it or about a week before i was like oh shit i've told what a bunch of people what if i don't make the cut <laughs> and i was like oh god and then so like every time i talk to somebody about like oh you're gonna watch the document i'm like yeah, just just make sure. I'm just I'm just hoping I'll, I make the cut. I hope I make the cut. Right. And then they used my voiceover in the in the tra- like in the first like minute of the of the thing, and I was like, all right, at least I made it that far. I'm not, at least I'm not cut out totally. Well, and the other thing though too was when when they filmed me, and when I was involved in phone interviews and all that jazz, they were very uncertain of what the final product would be. So I had little to no knowledge of what it would turn out to be. Like when they filmed me, they were like, yeah, we don't even know if this thing will ever be on TV, you know, or, or what we're going to do with this. So I, it wasn't until, um, I don't know. We, it was shortly before they reached out to me and they said, Hey, it's, it's going to air on this day. Um, Mm -hmm. and I did have some feel, they didn't tell me, they didn't have to tell me outwardly, but they, I did have some feel that I was at least going to be in it. But when you hear that the thing's going to be three hours, I mean, how many people you tell to tune in and what if you're on there for 15 seconds, you know, and, and they, yeah, they filmed me for like six hours or something ridiculous, but I'm probably on the show when you break it down and combine it all, I'm probably on the show for 10, 15 minutes or something like that. But yeah, I would say the same thing. I mean, I think we both had similar interview experiences. <clears throat> and I think we both ended up probably with similar amount of screen time. Um, I was actually pretty surprised with how much they used from, you know, my interview. And um, there really what there was only two people in that whole podcast. Well, I guess, if you include Jason, um, you know, Jason doesn't do a lot of interviews. So I'm pretty sure that this was the one and only that he was going to do. So Jason did that. He wasn't on my podcast, but Jim Tompkins, uh, he was not on it. And Lori Taylor, those are the only three people from the documentary that didn't make an appearance on the podcast. So, you know, I I feel like the podcast is a nice companion piece to the documentary for anybody who wants to learn more about the case and, you know, some more of the inside stuff of, what our theories are and the different types of evidence and you know some off the wall stuff and when james and i go and interview those people from the story you guys are in the diner yeah that was like uh, a diner or restaurant or something yeah uh i can't say where we were but it was uh definitely uh it was very cloak and dagger it was (laughs) except for the fact that we were in the middle of the public So I don't know how much cloak and dagger was really going on, but uh, it it was definitely, I got a phone call from James or a text message. It was like, what are you doing at four o'clock? And I'm like, uh, nothing. What's going on? And he's like, come with me. It's important. And I'm like, <laughs> okay. <laughs> so uh, I, you know, you never know with James what you're going to get yourself into. But uh, I definitely, I definitely think that, with the pro- with the podcast, the documentary, your, you know, you 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 always keep you always mention it. I mean, even in, I don't know if it was in the off the record thing or was it a recent episode. I'm not sure, but you guys were talking about like if you could go back and or if you could figure out. I think it was the Q and A on off the record. You know, if you could solve any case or if you could find the answer to any case. And I think you settled on Zodiac or whatever. But you know, you obviously talked about Amy Mahalovic and. You know, I think that's the one thing for the people that are so close to this case that, you know, we just want the damn thing solved. And I I think the, I think what the end of the day, I think we're all going to be a little disappointed at the end of the day, because even when he is arrested, I think it's going to be like, really? Because I mean, look at, look at the guy who was arrested for April Tinsley's death. Guy was a complete moron. I mean, it, I mean it was, he was a, he was a low garbage. He, yeah, even if you take away his the crimes that we later knew that he committed, mm-hmm. he's kind of a low life loser, like a, a loner. Didn't didn't doesn't seem to have a big group of friends. Uh, I mean, he's just kind of seemed like this dumb, pathetic guy. 
really. I mean, you, you look know? at that mug shot of him, and, and my gosh, I mean, you can just see the. I, and this was far from some criminal mastermind, is my point. Right. And I, and I think that, like, with a case like this, and we've talked about it before, when it goes on for so long, we put all these different theories out there, and we always want it to be something more than it really is. But at the end of the day, if they do, and God, let's hope they do, you know, make an arrest, I, I just don't know if it's going to be as satisfying because – like there's never closure. Like, like we feel the pain of the Mahalovic family because we've covered these cases now for, for, for so long. And you start to have a, an appreciation, well, not appreciation, but an empathy towards this family that's involved. And it's just like, there's even if it doesn't matter if the guy gets arrested tomorrow, they're not getting Amy back. It's not like they put cuffs yeah. on this guy and Amy walks in the door. Right. And I think that is the saddest thing that with all these cases and with all these true crime shows and, and I love my true crime shows. I mean, don't get me wrong. I mean, I'm a, I love it. It's just at the end of the day, it's just always so tragic for the families because they don't get the, they don't get, I mean, the, at least in the police station, they can, you know, take it off the board, but a family it's permanent. So I just well, think it's, and that's why I've never understood these wackadoos. And, and here's the thing. I, I will be, True Crime Garage will be at CrimeCon this year. We, we, we love going to CrimeCon. 97, 98% of the people that go to CrimeCon are absolutely awesome. But there's a small group, and I've spoke to some of these people at previous Crime Cons. And they're like, my favorite serial killer is Jeffrey Dahmer because of this, this. <laughs> and I'm like, he killed people. You have a, I, I like... <laughs> maybe he fascinates you the most. Maybe you're the most, maybe he's the most interesting one to you or whatever, but can you keep in mind that this is not, we're not talking about Freddie or Jason, or Mike Myers, you know, Michael Myers. We're talking about a real, these are real life people that lost loved ones that died in a horrible way because they were murdered by your favorite serial killer. Um, right. So, and that's, that's the, like you said, that's the sad thing. Hopefully they slap some cuffs on this dude. They find this guy, whoever he is, they convict him, but Amy's not coming back. And, 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 you know, John Walsh said it the best. And unfortunately it's true in this case. Mark Mahalovic is the father of a, of a murder victim of a murdered child. And he, even when they make an arrest and convict the guy, Mark Mahalovic will still be, the father of a, of a murder victim, you know, right. and, and, and that's what John Walsh says about the situation with his son. He will always be the parent of a, of a murdered child. And that's, that's the stone cold truth that people need to remind themselves when they get lost in the, uh, uh, these, some of these true crime shows and, 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 and my show, your show, what's on TV, remind mm -hmm. yourself, that these are real life people that are, that are still hurting, that are still, they, they still are hurting. Um, and so, and, and you know, what was, what was uh, heartbreaking for me, as you said, Jason doesn't talk about the case, doesn't do a lot of interviews. Mark, Mark does from time to time. He's, he's been good about, um, you know, opening up to people that have questions, but it was heartbreaking for me. I, I couldn't remember the last time seeing Jason's face and I didn't know he was going to be a part of the documentary. And when, when he popped on the screen for the very first time, man, I, I choked up a little bit. I choked up a little bit. Uh, you know, this is, this is a guy that uh, he's, he's, he's a victim um, and, in a big way and still is to this, this day. Um, yeah. Like, you're you're so right about Jason and, and and the fact that if there's any victim that's overlooked in this case, it's Jason because yeah. he's had to suffer the collateral damage of one. He lost his mom way too early. Um, there were lots of issues there. Uh, the issue, you know, he lost his sister to one of the most infamous unsolved crimes in the whole United States. And, you know, he's, le he's left to try to figure it all out and with 
just I, I just you're I, you're I mean I just feel like he's the victim that doesn't get discussed enough and right I mean Mar- Mark's out there but Jason you're right when Jason appeared on the show and it was like it was it was good to see his face because I think for people who don't know much about the case and or do know a lot about the case they don't see Jason very often there's there's only, there are very few pictures of him in in the newspapers and in the old clippings and all that stuff so you know what you what i will say about jason is man does he look like his dad (laughs) yeah yeah i mean the resemblance is uncanny i mean he is i mean and i know that they have a great relationship um mark and jason do Uh, i personally witnessed you know them on the phone uh making plans and 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 you know that was that was great to see and and i will say that you know having been to mark's house and been invited into their home and treated you know like family they they want nothing more than closure but they're they're i don't know they're just they're real people that want answers but god i just uh you just feel you just feel terrible for for the people that at the end of the day that it's just not going to be over even if there are cuffs on somebody's hands yeah so i mean i guess we could we could wrap it up on on that note but um but on another note, I mean, yeah, wait, like, okay. So give me your final thoughts. Like what are your, what are your final thoughts on um, the whole, the whole experience and the whole, I mean, again, you're happy with how it came out, but would you, I mean, would you be interested in doing other documentaries and stuff like that? You know, situations like that come up again. Um, I would love to do some more documentaries. However, there's a bit of a caveat in there. <laughs> Amy's case was uh, kind of near and dear to me, just in the sense that I've followed it for so long. It is one of my, you know, one of the cases that I, you know, I joke and I say there's, there are cases that I drag along with me everywhere I go. And Amy's case is one of those cases. And um, I know you said, and I agree with you, it, it might be a little, we we question how satisfying the outcome would be intellectually, I guess, for us uh, if it were to be solved. But I can I can think of a couple of cases where I uh, threw a one man party after they were finally solved. You know, years and years later, and I will in Amy's case. Um, I will beer of the week will be consumed. Um, very <laughs> shortly after in a, in, a, in a celebration for what we've waited too long for. Now, um, I agree with that. I mean, I'm not yeah. saying that I won't be, I mean, I am waiting for the day that I get the text from whomever will be most likely James, you know, cuffs around the suspect or whatever. Yes, I, I, I just, I'm just sort of like want the listeners to remember that at the end of the day that this is true life. This is real life stuff. And this isn't, you know, there's a family behind this whole thing. And well, and I've had several detectives tell me not, not specifically about Amy's case, just in general, they've said, you know, usually at the end of the day, you know, throughout my entire career, what I've always saw was at the end of the day, there was no good reason why this person took somebody else's life. There was no real good reason for it. There was no, nothing like you see on TV or in, in Hollywood with the, you know, fictional movies. And usually the individual is not some criminal mastermind or some brilliant, uh, undetectable serial killer. It's just not, it's just not real life. Um, but yeah, there will be a one person party when this, this thing is solved. And, and as far as doing other documentaries, it, the case has to be right for me. It has to be a case that I'm passionate about. Um, Mm. for, for me to be involved the way that I was with, with this documentary, because I am passionate about this case. And, um, so, so yeah, that's my whole thing. I would do, I'd love to do more, but it would have to be a case that, that I'm already eyeballs deep in it just because, because I am passionate about it. Um, I've had many phone calls, many, many, um, internet meetings with, with people that are looking for the next big to create the next big true crime TV show. And I start off every one of those meetings by saying, I'm still trying to figure out how to have the next big true crime podcast. So, um, (laughs) I, 
and you know what? I love doing the podcast. I really do. I, I like mm-hmm. being a, uh, a voice rather than a whole thing. Um, mm-hmm. I, I've always enjoyed talk radio and I think that true crime fits so perfectly on podcasts. It's just, I mean, it's perfect. People can tune into what they want to. You can, the great thing about podcasts is you can be very specific about what you want to listen to. You know, I love, I love sports talk radio. Love it. Okay. I'm a huge NFL fan. I could listen to people talk about the NFL every minute for the rest of my life. <laughs> now I, I live in Columbus, Ohio, which I'm, Born and raised, big time, diehard Buckeye football fan, right? But because I live in Columbus, Ohio, every sports talk radio here is Buckeyes 24-7. They don't stop. They don't stop. And so what's great about podcast is you can determine, you can go beyond that. You can go, not only do I like sports, but I like the NFL, and that's what I want to hear about. And same with podcasts. You can go, you know what? I like true crime. I like missing persons cases. I like solved cases. I like unsolved cases. I want to hear just about one particular case or I want to hear a new case every week, you know, and you can find that show. There's a show out there (laughs) for whatever reason, there's like a thousand true crime shows now. Um, Yeah. It's definitely one out there for everybody. Yeah. It's definitely the the genre du jour. Um, But the, I mean, the whole true crime thing, I think it's, yeah, it's fascinating. It's the medium itself for podcasts. I love it. I mean, I'm a former news producer uh, that saw what local news was like, you know, from the inside. And you know, it's it's a it's a business. And the great thing about podcasts is that you can put together your own podcast. You know, I independently produced this. I didn't. Um, you know, I obviously I had guests and help from James and people provided me with information and stuff like that. But like your podcast, it's you and the captain, you know, it's not like you're, you have producers and editors and it it's, it's about producing a good product for, for the public to consume. But the fact that you can do it yourself, like that to me kicks ass. Like I love the fact that I can say, okay, I'm passionate about the Amy Mahalovic case. And guess what? I'm going to do a podcast on it. And this is how I'm going to start it. And I said, and I don't know what it was March of last year that, okay, this is where I'm going to, what I'm going to do. And I set out and I started with James and went with, you know, started there and just worked my way through the system. And, I had already contacted all these people previously in, in my life because it was a case, like you said, you're just, this is one that you're just passionate about and I'm passionate about it myself. And I just, you know, I, I listened to you guys for like a year and a half and I was like, God, I love, I just like love the genre and I love the medium. I, why don't I just try it myself? And I, I mean, the best way to do anything is to just do it. And so I bought a bunch of mics and <laughs> I did a bunch of investigation as far as, you know, or interviews and, and, you know, fast forward a year and it's like, or not even a year and like everything's changed. So the fact that I was able to, and you, I mean, I like your origin story about it as well. Like you and the captain were both in a situation where you guys needed something to do one to not only bring in money, but you guys, I think we're both in between jobs. And yeah. so like the podcast just kind of became a natural thing. You're, you obviously had good rapport with one another. So I just think it's really cool how all this stuff comes together. And the fact that you and I can sit here and talk to each other from, you know, you're in Columbus, I'm here in Cleveland and it's like, we're sitting in the same room together. And right. I think the technology where it's at nowadays, the fact that I can hit, publish and boom the podcast goes out internationally <laughs> in a matter of minutes is uh, i think beyond anything that edward r murrow would have imagined i mean it really is truly a fa- fabulous medium oh yeah yeah and i think it's only going to continue to grow and it's exciting to see what other people are doing and and what uh, the future holds for all of us that are already doing it yeah i think that i think there's so many different avenues i mean like you know it's sort of like television when it first came out in the sense that you can do whatever the fuck you want to do and there's really nobody that's going to tell you 
y- you can't do it because why not? I mean, so I, I'm just, I'm, I'm excited about the future. I'm excited about, um, you know, future cases. And again, like, I'm very happy with the first go around as far as the, uh, the case went. I'm, I'm very happy with it, but, uh, or as far as the, the podcast goes, but, you know, it's on to the next one and definitely want resolve in this one. Speaking of which, I have something else I have to go do. So yeah, you Bill, do. So do I. You, and awesome I will talk, talk with to you, you soon. Man. Uh, text awesome. me, call me, email, we'll, we'll chat soon. Yeah, and we'll set something up and, uh, I don't know, get some, get together somehow and uh, we'll figure out some new project to, to work on as well. And uh, I appreciate all your time and thank you so much for uh, participating in the roundtable discussion of the Lake Erie murders who killed Amy <laughs> Mahalovic. Thanks, Thanks again, Bill. Nick. Have a great you night. Have a great day. Thanks, buddy. Bye. Bye. So there you have it. The conclusion to our discussion about the documentary, The Lake Erie Murders, Who Killed Amy Mahalovic. Thank you again for listening to this week's bonus episode of Who Killed Amy Mahalovic, and stay tuned for future episodes, as well as a new podcast that is in production. Thank you again to James Renner. All of his true crime books are available on Amazon.com. Cheers to Nick from the True Crime Garage podcast, as well as the Stitcher Premium show Off the Record, for his participation and time. And if you enjoy this independently produced podcast, you can help keep this show going by clicking the donate button on the bottom left on whokilledamymahalovic.com. Donations to support the show can also be made through the Venmo app with my username at bill-huffman-3. Thank you to the listeners and the donors that help keep this podcast going. Without your support, this show wouldn't be possible. So again, any amount is appreciated. But you can also help support the show by leaving a five-star review on Apple Podcast or wherever it is that you listen to podcasts because that will significantly help support the show and help get Amy's story the coverage it deserves. You can contact the Bay Village Police Department at 440-871-1234 if you have any new information. The FBI is offering a reward up to $25,000 for information leading to the arrest and conviction of the individual or individuals responsible for the death of Amy Renee Mahalovic. Anyone with information concerning this case, please contact the FBI at 1-800-CALL-FBI. Thank you again for listening, and please be safe.